There are over 700 geoglyphs carved into a desert in southern Peru that predate the Inca. They go back to between 500 BCE and 500 CE, or BC and AD, depending on your preference. So let's talk about the Nazca Lines. Who might have carved them, and why they exist? So first, let's take a look at one of the more famous Nazca Lines. Then we'll talk about what we definitely know about them. This is the Condor, a geoglyph that is almost 450 feet long. That's 134 meters for my non-American audience. It's famous partly because it's so large and recognizable, though there are plenty of other cool ones, like the hummingbird, the monkey, the spider, and this whale over here. The condor is one of the largest geoglyphs, and for those of you wondering, geoglyphs comes from geo, which means earth, and glyph, or carving, so earth carving. There are famous geoglyphs in the chalky hills of England too and elsewhere, but I'll do those in a separate mini. They're not unique, just to Peru. Now, as you can see, the condor is scraped into the desert environment. The different color comes from the exposed dirt underneath. They're dug about half a foot or 15 centimeters deep. But what's really fascinating is that the Nazca lines aren't just these animals. Most of them are actually just straight lines that run across the desert. And when put together, they run for more than 800 miles, or 1,300 kilometers. I have so many questions. Why are some of them lines and some of them recognizable shapes? Why are they called the Nazca lines? Is there a rhyme or reason to their shape or location? Who made them? And most importantly, do we know why they made them? That last question will be tricky, because I know that early Andean societies only had a spoken language, not a written one, so we don't have any sources beyond archaeological evidence and some passed down and likely watered down oral histories. But let's see what we can do to answer these questions. First, let's do some of the easy historical ones. Why are they called the Nazca Lines, and who likely created them? Well, we call them the Nazca Lines because they're found outside the city of Nazca in Nazca Province in southern Peru. But beyond that, the lines, the city, the province, they named after the peoples of the Nazca culture that lived there between 100 BCE and 800 CE. And we also know that the Nazca peoples were the ones who created those lines. At least, we think, based off of timing. Now, the Nazca were an agricultural society whose heartland surrounded several different river systems that flow from the Andes to the Pacific. And like with many Andean societies, they grew crops like corn and beans and squash and peanuts and peppers and potatoes. So many varieties of potatoes. Did you know that there were roughly 5,000 types of potatoes in the world? And 3,000 of them exist in the Andes alone. That's a lot of potato. And the Andes is also where the potato was first cultivated. So we can thank them for French fries and tots and jacket potatoes and all the delicious tasty potato treats we love to eat. Now, in addition to agriculture, pre-Columbian Andean groups also ate a ton of seafood and smaller mammals, like otters if they found them on the coast, or guinea pigs. And though llamas and alpacas were around, they were way more valuable as beasts of burden to help carry things, or sometimes they were used in important rituals. It was not a common meal staple. The diet of the early Andean was much more seafood and agricultural crop heavy. They didn't have things like pigs or chickens or cows. All of that was over in Afro-Eurasia. So we're talking about a South America way before the world was interconnected in the post-Columbian era. Now, it's hard for us to know too much about Nazca life, but we can gather details from the things left behind. For example, we have ample pottery, and not only does it show people, like this warrior here, but it also shows animals very similar to those drawn in the desert of the Nazca Valley. Oh, also, we've got some elongated skulls that date back to the Nazca period as well. I did an episode on that, because it's cool looking, and they look a bit like aliens, but they're not, they're humans. But that episode's only available to my Patreon subscribers, where I put up a Patreon-only video every Tuesday, and by this point, there's a pretty big backlog. I also did one on there on Aztec cannibal soup, so consider joining <laughs> to support me, but also to get access to different kinds of content. Now, the lines themselves date back to the same time as the Nazca people, so again, we're pretty confident they were done by their namesake group. But why, though? 
Why are some lines and why are some animals? We don't really know, but we do have some speculative guesses based on various pieces of evidence. So let's go over that with some quasi historiography. For those of you who haven't studied history beyond high school, historiography is essentially the history of history. How have writings about history changed over time? How has our knowledge of the past and the way we write about it changed over time and why? But for this video, we'll adapt that to how have our views about the purpose of the Nazca Lines changed over time and why. Now, the first literary mention of the Nazca Lines dates back to a conquistador named Pedro Cieza de Leon, who wrote a book published in 1553 called the Cronicas del Peru, or the Chronicle of Peru. But the first archaeologist to study the Nazca Lines was a Peruvian named Toribio Mejia Cespe in 1926. But he only had access to them from the ground, which is not the best way to fully see, understand, and appreciate them. So the Nazca Lines entered the public awareness and consciousness in the 1930s when we start seeing plane travel over the desert. In 1941, American professor Paul Kosak was studying the lines around the time of the winter solstice. I'm not sure if that was intentional or accidental, but as the sun set, on the day after the solstice, he looked up to notice that it set in direct alignment with the line he was studying. So that became a prominent theory. The lines have something to do with the solstices and the sun, just like other pieces of monumental architecture around the world, like Stonehenge. And this was supported by other archaeologists, like German-born but Peruvian transplant Maria Reich, nicknamed the Lady of the Lines. She argued fervently that the lines were there for astronomical purposes and helped with the calendar cycle. Beyond that, she also lived in a shack next to the lines to protect it from visitors who might destroy them. More on that in a moment, but that's where she gets her nickname from. Now, in 1985, Johann Reinhard, who was also famous for having discovered the Yuya Yako Maiden and other Inca mummies, used available evidence to suggest that the geoglyphs represented deity worship particularly connected to water, as that was a necessary component for survival in the desert for their heavily agricultural society. In 1990, Gerald Hawkins and Anthony Avini, who study archaeoastronomy, concluded that there wasn't enough evidence to support a claim that the lines were astronomical, casting doubt on the work of people like the Lady of the Lines. And later, in 1998, we get another idea. Phyllis Pitluga of the Adler Planetarium Chicago, she thought that the geoglyphs were representations of heavenly shapes. But Anthony Avini dismissed this theory as well for a lack of evidence. A little bit later, 2002, David Johnson argued in his article, co-written by Donald Prowl and Stephen Maybe, that the geoglyphs followed the paths of aquifers. Perhaps the straight lines were once aqueducts and they collected and carried water around. And there are more and more and more. There are a lot of people with a lot of theories. Some speculate the geoglyphs were part of rituals to summon water, or that some of them, like the spiders and the birds and the plants, were fertility symbols. Some people propose that it was aliens who came down and made them. So what might account for the changing ideas? Well, part of it is connecting it with other societies of similar technological backgrounds. The fact that at least one of the lines happened to link up with the winter solstice spawned comparisons with other societies who built things to honor the solstice as well, like I mentioned with Stonehenge. But one thing that is changing our conversation about the Nazca lines now is changing technology. In the past decade, hundreds of new geoglyphs have been found in the desert. Yamagata University, in conjunction with IBM Japan, used AI and machine learning to identify new geoglyphs. By feeding high-resolution aerial photos into their machine learning platform, AI was able to sort through large volumes of data and look for patterns leading to the discovery of new geoglyphs, like this smaller man-shaped one. And more recently, in 2024, Yamagata University's Nazca Institute, still in collaboration with IBM, announced that it found 303 more. Cats, monkeys, killer whales, and even decapitated heads. So as we get more information and find more lines, perhaps our ideas about what they mean or stand for will also change. That's one of the nice benefits of AI, which regardless of how you feel about it, isn't going away. But for the Nazca lines, we still don't really know why they were made. But so many exist, which tells us that there has to be a reason. 
We just don't conclusively know what that is. As for me, I tend to go with the more recent ideas that it has to do with water, it makes sense for their civilization and its location. As Johann Reinhardt noted in his book about the Nazca Lines, quote, It seems likely that most of the lines did not point at anything on the geographical or celestial horizon, but rather led to places where rituals were performed to obtain water and fertility of crops. No single evaluation proves a theory about the lines, but the combination of archaeology, ethnohistory, and anthropology builds a solid case. End quote. And let's hope that the Nazca lines continue to inspire researchers over the years, because there isn't a Lady of the Lines to protect the site anymore. And in fact, there's been damage to these ancient marbles. The story I remember most is from 2018, when a truck driver drove across the Nazca lines. Look at all this damage. Thousands of years destroyed for no apparent reason. The man responsible was found and detained, but they couldn't prove that he did it with intent, so he was given a fine and nine months of preventative detention. And before that, in 2014, Greenpeace left footprints there as they were trying to put up a sign about climate change, which is mildly ironic, I suppose. Very stupid. And more recently, off-road racers and squatters have been leaving their marks behind. I mean, look at all of this. It's heartbreaking. Go find somewhere less historic to drive your vehicles around, please. There's plenty of room everywhere else. My name is Kelly Beard, and thank you for listening to this AFOUT mini on the Nazca Lines. If you enjoyed this episode, go check out some of my other minis or my longer podcast episodes, which drop every other Sunday. Sources for this episode are in the description, and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any more bloody, gross, mysterious, or weird stories from history. <laughs>